And so currently right now then, uh, as Chris is new speaker, uh, I think there's some talks that this, uh, the, the Representative Madigan um, will, will resign from his, his house seat, the 22nd uh, House District, representing West Lawn, South Side Chicago. Um, I think there's some also reports that people were flaring out his apartment down there in Springfield. I, your, any takes on that, that he might uh, resign, call quits? I, I've spoken to him once since the uh, events of the 13th. He sounds in really good spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, he seems like he's um, at peace with what he, what he decided to do. Uh, I can't speak beyond that to what his intentions are. Uh, I think he's got a ton of institutional knowledge and, you know, Whatever he decides to do, I hope he continues to share that in, 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 in ways that are helpful to members like Chris, myself, others who, who've always known sort of the guy behind the curtain was different than what was perceived publicly. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'll get to what, what would you, your opinion on his, his legacy because he, uh, I mean, he was essentially elected as a committeeman in the late 60s and then he, be, uh, he was one of the few people uh, probably still alive, part of the 1970. Illinois State uh, Constitutional Convention, along with uh, Richard M. Daley. Um, but what, uh, when it comes to the political side of the speaker, I think uh, you mentioned maybe uh, uh, publicly, but I think a lot of people um, who aren't involved in the political space, they, he does have a pretty big control of uh, an influence when it comes to state politics here, not necessarily the legislative mm -hmm. side, but the political side as well. Um, he controls four main camp campaign funds um, with a lot of with basically a lot of money in it um, and so what do you what do you see the future of those campaign funds really I know like one of them the state Senate or the state um, Democratic majority I think there are some talks of transferring that to maybe uh, rep uh, speaker Welsh yeah he's got friends of Michael J Madigan um, he's got the 13th Ward Democratic organization and he another one that um, doesn't really occur to my mind but Democratic, I think the four I know of are friends of Mike Madigan, 13th Ward, Democratic Majority, and then the State Party. The State Party, yeah. Which is yeah. actually hard to, you know, it depends on what the Central Committee wants to do with it. So, um, I, I don't know. I was getting, you know, I don't, I, 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 he has yet to ask me how he should spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, uh, let me check right now. No, no, he hasn't called yet. So, uh, I think. He's always been a guy who wants to see Democrats get elected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's also always been a person who supports his colleagues. Uh, my sense is he'll take some time, digest his personal decision, and decide how he wants to proceed, whether he wants to remain politically active. You know, I, 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 I don't think that the money uh, is, is the first and foremost on his mind right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And going back to the legacy thing, too, um, you mean working with him? He is a very, uh, I guess, safe to say, maybe introverted guy. Yeah. At least when it comes to uh, the press and the public, um, uh, doesn't do a lot of interviews or didn't do a lot of interviews when he uh, was a speaker. Um, because of that, too, I think we even kind of, as you know, I'm kind of a, you're a steward, or, a steward of Chicago political history mm -hmm. as well as I. Um, the tenure of Richard J. Daly as well as M. had been pretty well documented, right? We have we have a ton of books on the Cook County Democratic Party, on Richard M. Daly, Richard J. Daly. But when it comes to a figure like uh, Michael J. Madigan and the speaker, there really hasn't been that much like literature or documentation on his inner workings and all that. So where, where do you where do you see his legacy moving forward when it comes to some of those some of those uh, some, some of the literature and books that haven't really been produced yet on him. Is yeah, I, 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 on him? I think it'll take an objective source to do that. I, I don't think he'll write an autobiography. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I think it'll take several years to grasp uh, his impact on the state of Illinois. You know, I think he is a guy who um, had to consistently adjust to circumstances that over the course of four years probably changed a lot. Um, he, early on in his career, was more moderate. Uh, his Catholicism, I think, and his the dis nature of his district led him to more moderate policy choices. And that's but, a good point, too, because if you, uh, Illinois, uh, Illinois Review, they have some articles back in 1987 where uh, people would know in the 80s, actually, there are a lot of clashes between Republicans and Democrats on tax increases in mm -hmm. the 80s. 
And it was actually the Republicans who were supporting the tax increases with Thompson. And it was Speaker was actually the, pe- the person who opposed all the tax increases. Yeah. And, I, and so it's kind of ironic yeah. right now when you're kind of looking back and thinking of it. But uh, you go back and read that piece, and you're uh, you're reading it, and he does hold, per, I guess, what you call uh, financially conservative views. Yeah, yeah. he still does. He, mm-hmm. He's 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 very uh, he, he's not a person who I would call a tax and spend liberal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I and and it, I. You know he, he's going to get a fair share of criticism for the financial condition of the state. Um, I think there's a lot of people who deserve a lot of criticism for the financial condition of the state. You're looking at one of them. Um, you know we, we none of us are absolved of blame for a lot of this stuff. Um, I would say again as he progressed his his choices moved a little more left only because that was the nature of his caucus. His caucus moved a little more left. I think he saw that uh, the Democratic Party needed um, needed to be more leftist to oppose some of the extreme ideas out of the right, and I also think that um, he just decided later in his career that the things he thought early in his career would be problematic, both governmentally, morally, politically, just weren't as problematic anymore. So that's, I think, when you saw that lurch, we have this sort of lurch word left. Mm-hmm. And going back, so that's a good point. So going back 40 years, what do you think is his, his key initiative was? The, the biggest impact yeah, yeah. you think he made uh, for the state of Illinois? I guess you can say politically that, well, we're, not a, we're, we're a blue state and basically a red uh, territory, right? I mean, we're looking at Wisconsin, who historically uh, middle class, blue collar Democrats, but could certainly turn Republican. Yeah. Uh, you have Indiana that's red, Iowa red. So from a political standpoint, you can say, well, you know, he was able to uh, put together a, a uh, an organization where uh, Illinois remained democratic. But from a, a legislative standpoint, uh, what do you think the biggest legislative impact he probably had in the last 40 years? Um, probably the end of conference committees. And I know that's okay. really a kind of an arcane thing to say, but, but what's interesting to me is what... What I know of conference committees in, in the 90s was they were places where pieces of legislation that had been buried were, would re-arise at the very end, like Phoenix from the Ashes, and get into bills. And as a result, we would have very bad policy choices with very little public scrutiny. Uh, perfect example that uh, is, is proof positive is the 3% compound interest for teachers. Mm-hmm. I'm reasonably certain can be a conference committee. Uh, so, like, that's a real processy answer, right? But, but it's legacy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's his stamp that this was a bad thing that was not good for anybody. We should we should put it aside and do things differently. Well, I think that's a good point too because people who um, aren't working in Springfield or they wouldn't probably had thought of that, right? Right. You so you have like an internal organizational structure to make the organization of the state operate more efficiently and effectively. So sure. that's pretty interesting. Um, so the conference committees, uh, go, uh, there have been a lot of talk on rules changes when it comes to the House. Are the conference committees here to stay? Are any any anticipation on any rule changes? I don't see us returning the conference committee. They, I still think that's probably not going to happen. Rules changes wise, um, I think you've heard the speaker publicly acknowledge a desire to um, to. Uh, see a, uh, a term limit for a speaker and minority leader. That could be a rule change. You'll see some things, I think, that may make the chamber flow a little faster, maybe, but but I don't expect any astronomical rule changes right now. Okay.